This week on BuzzFeed Unsolved, we take a look at the bizarre disappearance of Bobby Dunbar, a case that's inspired controversy unlike any case we've covered before. In summary, this case proves that a happy ending is only relative. What? Yeah. It's <laughs> what, are you, what are you talking about? That's as dark as it, as it seems. Okay. Why is it controversial? We don't do well with controversial things, This case Ryan. is is bonkers. I don't know how else to really describe it. I don't think I can really oversell it either. It's one of the weirdest cases I've ever read. You've intrigued me. Holy, okay. Yeah. Enthusiasm out of the gate. Should we get into Let's it? Let's get into it. On Friday, August 23rd, 1912, four-year-old Bobby Dunbar, along with his family, were staying at their family cabin in Louisiana on Swayze Lake, a heavily wooded area that was more like a swamp. The 11 party members included Bobby's parents, Lessie and Percy Dunbar, Bobby's brother, Alonzo, as well as several other family and friends. On that day, Percy Dunbar, Bobby's father, had to leave for work, much to young Bobby's dismay, who in a tantrum about his father leaving, broke the strap of his straw hat. Lessie, Bobby's mother, was preparing for a fish fry. Bobby then expressed that he wanted to go with Paul Mizzy, a family friend, to the lake to shoot garfish. Paul often took Bobby horseback riding and had an affectionate nickname for him, Heavy. His mother allowed it, and the rest of the boys in the party decided to join. Later, the group of boys were called back for lunch, and they started making their way back, though from here the details get fuzzy. Paul recalled putting Bobby's brother Alonzo on his shoulders, joking with Bobby, quote, get out of the way, Heavy, or I'll run you over, end quote. Bobby's response, what some newspapers report as his last words, was characteristic to his personality, retorting, quote, you can't do it, you ain't no bigger than me, end quote. When they returned back to camp, Leslie realized her son Bobby was no longer with the group and was missing. Paul and the boys all walk back to the house. Yeah, because Paul has a, now a gaggle of children with him. So he's trying to look after everyone? Yeah, and then and he just wanted them. Somehow, the one that he seems to be closest to has yeah. a, a fun nickname for. Yeah. He doesn't see him? Yeah, I guess he doesn't see him, yeah. Are you looking at Paul right now with a suspicious lens? Yes, I am. That makes sense. It's I mean, little, like when you look little, at the details, a suspect yeah. to just suddenly, oh, I don't know where the boy went. I mean, if that's where your detective brain leads you, maybe follow the instinct. Okay. She and Paul began to call out for Bobby in a panic, and at one point, Lessie fainted into the dirt. Three men from the party began to search north on the wagon trail behind the camp in case Bobby had gone after his father. On their search, they ran into Percy on his way back from working who raced to camp when he heard of Bobby's disappearance. By that night, with no trace of Bobby, searchers began to look for Bobby's body. They used dynamite to blast throughout the lake, while a thick cable with massive hooks stretched across the length to drag the depths. Wait, w w what's the idea here? It's gonna blow all the water out of the lake, or? Uh... Yeah, I guess it would blow the water out, and then for a brief fleeting moment, you could see the bottom of the lake there. What? And I guess if Bobby was next to the dynamite, then his... I guess I don't know if you're at the bottom of the lake to begin with, maybe you're not in great shape. After the night was over, divers also went into the lake to search any coves the hooks were unable to reach or places where a body could get trapped in the weeds. The only corpse they turned up from these efforts was that of a deer. Because Bobby's body had not been recovered in the lake, searchers believed he could have been killed by an animal, with the most likely predator being an alligator. Searchers even cut alligators open, hoping they might find his remains inside, to no avail. By Saturday, August 24th, about 500 men had come to search for Bobby. Searchers even did a test using a straw hat with a broken strap like the one Bobby had on to test how long it could float, finding that it could float uninhibited for hours, leading searchers to believe there should have at least been some evidence of Bobby's hat. So it should be, that hat should be a dead giveaway as to his location. If he drowned in that lake, you would see that hat somewhere. Yeah. Especially since like, it wasn't like, oh, several hours later they noticed he was missing. They mm -hmm. noticed he was missing pretty, pretty right, you know, pretty soon. The stress of Bobby's disappearance caused his mother, Lessie, to become grievously ill, and most of the family had to return to their home in Opelousas, Louisiana. Paul Mizzy, who had been the last adult to see Bobby alive, along with two other men who had been guests at that fateful fish fry that day, would stay and continue to search for weeks more. Searchers found a solitary set of bare footprints leading toward a railroad trestle bridge heading out of the swamp, with still no body or even a trace of evidence to prove he had been killed by an animal. Those who continued the desperate search began to question if Bobby could have been kidnapped. 
It was speculated that someone in a small boat could have taken him through the north end of the lake into the bayou, or someone on foot could have taken him on the trail or down the train tracks. Searchers had run into stragglers walking along the tracks and began to question if one of them could have taken Bobby. By August 26th, the authorities had also contacted the police in New Orleans, about 130 miles away, to search for Bobby there, giving those invested in the theory of his kidnapping further hope and official validation. Percy Dunbar would also go to New Orleans himself to distribute 700 copies of Bobby's picture and talk with many reporters. A detective agency made postcards with a picture and description of Bobby and mailed them to town and county officials from East Texas to Florida. The description of Bobby that was widely distributed read, quote, age four years and four months, full size for age, stout but not fat, large round blue eyes, light hair and very fair skin, with rosy cheeks. Left foot had been burned when a baby and shows a scar on the big toe, which is somewhat smaller than big toe on the right foot, wore blue rompers and a straw hat without shoes, end quote. It just seems like a lot of, a lot of people go missing around train tracks. Yeah, I mean, a lot of interesting characters hang around the train tracks. What does that, what does that mean? I mean, back in the day, vagrants. Oh, you made it sound like you, like you, I, you've we, been there. Like yeah. I've been on the train tracks? Yeah. What if I have? Have you? Yeah, I've been on the train tracks before. You hang around the train tracks? There was an abandoned train track around my town, and sometimes, like, people would go there and <sighs> hang out. I'm actually a little bit jealous. Yeah, it's pretty good. I always wished my town had a quarry growing up. Was just fucking hang out at the quarry and shoot guns at cans. The Dunbar's whole hometown of Opelousas held out hope that Bobby was still alive and together contributed to a $1,000 reward, which was, quote, to be paid to any person or persons who will deliver to his parents alive little Robert Clarence Dunbar, no questions asked, end quote. In 1912, this was a relatively enormous amount, roughly equivalent to about $22,000 today. However, after over eight months, with no sign of Bobby, the unused reward money was returned to the townspeople who had donated it. But only a week after, a major lead in the case broke. In April 1913, a wire from the ladies of Hub came to alert the Dunbars that an old tinker slash peddler named William Cantwell Walters was spotted in the small town of Hub in Southern Mississippi with a boy resembling Bobby though his foot had been too covered in grime for anyone to get a good look. Walters had given authorities various and inconsistent answers about who the child belonged to, saying it was his own, his sister's, etc. Eventually, the ladies had witnessed Walters whipping the child, finally giving a citizen's committee enough to temporarily detain Walters and examine the boy, which they then firmly believed was Bobby, but asked the Dunbars to send further photo evidence. The Dunbars remained skeptical until they in turn received photos of the boy. And at this point, the Dunbars traveled to Mississippi to see him in person, still not sure if it was their Bobby. The boy they had found had a scar on his left foot, as well as a mole on his neck where Bobby had one. However, he refused to answer to the name Bobby. And when Lessie tried to hold him, he refused to interact with her. Lessie asked to see the boy again the next day and in their time together was able to give him a bath. At this point, she felt without any doubt that they had found Bobby. In a wave of emotion, she's recalled as shouting, quote, thank God it is my boy, end quote, before fainting. Meanwhile, William C. Walters, the man whom the boy was taken from, was insistent that the boy was not Bobby Dunbar, but in fact, Bruce Anderson. That's a fake name. <laughs> That's not a real name. <laughs> Bruce Anderson. Bruce Anderson does seem like a name you would make up if you were like pressed in the moment. Mm -hmm. Bruce Anderson. I don't. I don't have any uh, info on his cadence either. Like if they're like, what's his name? Uh, uh, Br Brick Brown Bruce <coughs> Anderson. Uh, stuff, my, what, was my, what was that? I am and what was that? What was that? You say that again? Bruce Anderson. There it is. And but he and he still can't get his story straight as to how he knows this boy? He's about to say what, how he knows this boy if right now. If you're whipping a boy, you better know whose boy that is. Yeah, I mean, I mean, maybe don't just whip a boy at all. Don't whip a boy, first and foremost. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but don't whip children. Here's his story. Walters claimed the boy was the illegitimate son of his brother and a woman named Julia Anderson, who had cared for his elderly parents back home in Barnesville, North Carolina. Julia Anderson was a single mom who did in fact work as a field hand and a caretaker for William Walters' parents. 
Walters claimed that Julia had given him the boy willingly, which Julia did confirm, though she disputed some of the details of his story, telling a paper, quote, Walters left Barnesville, North Carolina with my son, Charles Bruce, in February of 1912, saying that he only wanted to take the child with him for a few days on a visit to the home of his sister. I have not seen the child from that day to this. I did not give him the child. I merely consented for him to take my son for a few days." End quote. Some were skeptical at his motives to claim he was given consent to take the child, as kidnapping was a capital offense in Louisiana, and he could be just trying to avoid the kidnapping charge. He wrote to the Dunbars explaining so much and begged them to send for her, saying, quote, I know by now you have decided. You are wrong. It is very likely I will lose my life on account of that, and if I do, the great God will hold you accountable." End quote. He's got a boy. Boy's not his. Yes. Boy does allegedly belong to his brother and his brother's mistress. And he's saying that they... Uh, and he's saying, yeah, I shouldn't have this boy. Belongs to my brother and that other lady. But it's my... It's still our boy. And I gotta give this boy back. Yeah. They're saying, no, that boy's our boy. That's our, that's our little straw hat boy. That's heavy. Yeah. That's our little boy. Yeah. So if, if they try to take that boy from him, boy, is he up a creek without a paddle. Yeah. Right? If that boy is, in fact, Bobby Dunbar, he's going to be charged with kidnapping. Yeah. And he will die. Because if it's the other boy, which is his brother's son, he can claim that he was given consent to, get, had to have that boy. He has no grounds for that if it's Bobby Dunbar. Oh no, yeah, that's the other rub in it. That's what, I'm, that's what the main thing is. So he's saying to the Dunbars, if you say that's Bobby Dunbar, you know it's not him, I'm gonna be killed. Yeah, and he'll be also be in trouble because then where's that other boy that he's supposed to have? I mean, he's, that's the least of his worries. He's gonna be killed for one thing. He's, he's got a, a lot of worries. He's got a this lot of worries. This guy's got worries. He's only got one play here, and it's that it's not Bobby Dunbar. Yeah. But these parents are positive it's Bobby Dunbar. Even though the little boy is, I mean, and granted, the boy could be under some, some distress, but uh, the boy is claiming that he is not Bobby Dunbar, not answering to the The name boy is Bobby. not saying anything. The boy is silent. A newspaper in New Orleans arranged to bring Julia Anderson to Mississippi so she could identify the boy as well, and she arrived in Opelousas on May 1st, 1913. However, stepping into the Dunbar's hometown, Julia Anderson was essentially already on enemy territory, as the town had already decided that the boy was Bobby Dunbar, who had miraculously come back to them. His return was made into a huge spectacle, and he rode through town and into the square on a fire engine covered in flowers. When Julia Anderson met the boy, he did not react well to her, much like he had originally acted with Leslie Dunbar, though he may still have been reeling from the many sudden changes in his life including the fact that in his beautiful new home, he had just been given a pony and a bicycle. What are you talking about? He got a <laughs> pony and a bike? <laughs> what? Okay, so this is, this is a very, very tricky case because on one hand, he did not react well to Leslie Dunbar when he first met her. Sure. A little bit of time later, now he is accepted he is Bobby Dunbar, but then we find out it's because, not because, but maybe because, he was given a pony and yeah. a bicycle, which I, I seems kind of redundant. Why it. would you need a bicycle if you have a pony? I guess you could, oh, you wouldn't ride the pony. What do you even do with a pony? I guess you pet well, it. A bike you can do like feed sick, it some sick jumps and stuff. Pony not gonna do that. Yeah, I, I guess pony you get could, mad if you try I guess you could do sick jumps. So were they essentially bribing him? Because I can see him being like, I don't know this lady, I've never met this lady, but it, this lady's gonna give me a pony? This is my mom. It may be too strong to say they bribed him. Because I could, I could see that, but you could also say, Boy, I thought my kid was dead for eight months. He's now back. I'm going to shower him with affection, affection give him all the things that I wish I could have gave him. Yeah. Like, you, in the eight months, I'm imagining they were like, I could wish I could have done this, I could have said that. And now he's back, it's like, fuck it, I'm gonna give him a pony and a bicycle. Yeah. There's oh, a fire engine yeah, covered yeah. with flowers. Yeah. Additionally, Anderson had been missing her son for even longer than the Dunbars. It had been 15 months since she had allowed Walters to take Bruce, and he had never returned with him. Similar to Leslie Dunbar, at first, Anderson also had trouble identifying the boy as her son, but soon after stated that, quote, her mother's heart, end quote, knew that the boy was her son. However, unlike with Leslie Dunbar, 
Anderson's initial uncertainty was not easily forgiven by the press. The press largely demonized her for having three children by two different men, and it was implied she was a prostitute. Others called her illiterate and naive. They also called attention to the fact that she had lost all of her children within just a year. She had to give her daughter up for adoption. She had a baby who died a sudden death that she was wrongfully blamed for. Then Bruce was taken from her. An article written in the New Orleans Item wrote of Anderson, quote, she had not seen her son since February of 1912. She had forgotten him. Animals don't forget, but this big, coarse country woman, several times a mother, she forgot, end quote. This writer is really quite brutal. <laughs> yeah, Jesus Christ. Uh, not, really, it's, uh, not really some unbiased journalism here's, there. Here's the thing, also. This big, coarse country woman. Yeah, I mean, here, also... You Why gotta, do you gotta say big? Here, the, the thing you gotta keep in mind about this quote, which is what I was thinking when I read it, was even if this is not her son, she still, she still is a, missing a son. A fucking She's human. still missing a son. She's, She's a still missing being. all of her children, yeah. and you don't have to rub it in that it's not her son. Like, uh, well, let's remark about how sad this big, coarse country woman is. It's not Jesus. your son, you fucking loser. <laughs> like, Unbelievable. Like, it's Jesus Christ. There's no compassion from this yeah. writer at all. Have compassion for this, uh, this poor woman. A court-appointed arbiter ruled that the boy was the Dunbar's missing son rather than Anderson's, as Anderson had no lawyer, no money, and no allies in Opelousas. She left town, and the boy was uncontestedly allowed to remain Bobby Dunbar. William Walters went through a two-week trial that was described by some as, quote, sensational, end quote, at which he was convicted of kidnapping and sentenced to life in prison. After just two years in jail, William Walters' verdict was overturned on an appeal, and he was granted a new trial on a technicality. As for the boy, he grew up and lived as Bobby Dunbar. At 18, he fell in love with a girl named Marjorie from a nearby town. They married in 1935 and had four children. He passed away in 1966, always believing he was Bobby Dunbar. But this story doesn't end there. Skipping forward to 1999, Bobby Dunbar's granddaughter, Margaret Dunbar Cutright, began looking deeper into her family's history. Cutright had always been especially intrigued by the family legend of her grandfather's kidnapping and had asked her grandmother to tell her the story many times in her childhood. It was then a story she told to her own children. A scrapbook with over 400 articles about the Dunbar case was given to Cutright by her father. She writes of the project, quote, the scrapbook was like a jigsaw puzzle without the picture on the box. And over the next few months, I lost myself in trying to piece it together. End quote. She was especially affected by an editorial cartoon from 1913, titled 50 Years From Now, in which a bearded old man sits in a chair with his grandson looking at newspapers from the Dunbar kidnapping trial and asks, quote, Grandpa, do you think we'll ever know for certain what our right name is? End quote. Ooh. Yeah. Heavy. Yeah. She's living the cartoon that she's looking at. I mean, that's what happened. She saw the cartoon. The and cartoon was, like, was that, referencing- That's the, me, yeah. what she was currently doing. Cutright instantly noticed discrepancies in how newspapers were reporting the events. For example, there were at least two different reported versions of Lessie and Bobby's reunion. One paper stated that Lessie recognized Bobby immediately, while the other described Lessie as unsure, even including a quote from Lessie saying, quote, I do not know, I am not quite sure, end quote. She also found that Percy and Lessie had originally told the papers that the boy didn't look like their son and that his eyes were too small. Some newspapers also reported Bobby didn't recognize his father, mother, or brother Alonzo. She also was disturbed to read the many biased accounts of Julia Anderson from the time and to read that from Anderson's perspective, she had felt that the Dunbars had kidnapped her son. Linda Tarver, the granddaughter of Julia Anderson, says of the family perception, quote, all of us cousins grew up. We knew that we had an uncle that had been taken by the Dunbar family in Opelousas, Louisiana. We always said kidnapped. We said they kidnapped him, end quote. Cutright continued her search obsessively, researching at small town libraries, archives, and courthouses all over the South. Eventually, the idea of testing her grandfather's DNA came up. Cutright's father, Bobby Dunbar Jr., agreed to give a DNA sample to compare with a sample given by one of her great uncles, a son of Bobby's brother, Alonzo. This was a controversial choice, and many in the family urged Dunbar to leave the pass alone. 
Gerald Dunbar, one of Cutright's uncles, said of the matter, quote, no matter how a DNA test turns out, there's going to be a sense of loss. What is to be truly gained? End quote. It seems kind of stupid to, to not do it. I don't know this guy's like, what's to be gained? It's like, well, people are suffering and would like to know what the truth yeah, is. I mean, the truth, that's Maybe what's to let's be gained. <laughs> find it out and, you know, if it's, if it's devastating, I feel like enough time has passed that members of both of the families could probably get together and be like, yeah, our ancestors were shitheads. E yeah, and not so much shitheads, but just like they, they made the wrong call. Well, yes, There's they a, kidnapped a boy. They, I don't know if they kidnapped a boy. They thought- They may have kidnapped a they boy. They may have kidnapped a boy. They may have just misidentified their own son, which is odd. I but, mean, eyes don't get smaller. Eyes don't get smaller. They're not gonna look at their boy and go, yeah, his eyes look small, uh, that but, uh, <laughs> that's probably him. That's one newspaper that said that. I'm just saying, uh, yeah, I guess there is a lot to be gained here. Truth, catharsis. Truth. Yeah, uh, you know, put it to bed. Yeah, I think that's good. And Ooh. if it is truly uh, Bruce, if it was Bruce, then. Now, now, wait a second okay. here. Uh, all right. The, 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 the DNA they're testing, Bobby Dunbar Jr. is giving his DNA up right. to, to this test. They're comparing it to uh, was a great uncle, a son of Bobby's brother Alonzo, to truly see if he is a Dunbar. It's the real Bobby Dunbar. However, they are not testing this DNA to an Anderson right. to prove that they are a match too. Okay. Just gonna put that So out. we can at least rule out the based Dunbars. on his DNA that he is or is not a Dunbar. Exactly. When the test results came back, shockingly, the samples did not match, leaving Bobby's son, Robert Dunbar Jr., himself surprised. He said of the outcome, quote, my intent was to prove that we were Dunbars. The results didn't turn out that way, and I've had to do some readjusting of my thinking, but I would do it again, end quote. Still, although this test proves that the boy was not Bobby Dunbar, there does not seem to have been a test administered to prove that the boy was in fact Bruce Anderson. Hollis Rawls, Anderson's son, had expressed a willingness to submit DNA before he passed away. But even without confirmation of that DNA evidence, many were apt to believe that Bobby Dunbar had actually been Bruce Anderson. In terms of incorrectly identifying himself as a Dunbar, Bobby Dunbar Jr. recalled a conversation he had with his father when he was a teenager, in which he asked his father how he knew he was Bobby Dunbar, and remembered his father telling him, quote, I know who I am, and I know who you are, and nothing else makes a difference." End quote. And they gave me a pony. <laughs> and they that's, gave me that's what he's way saying. to ruin a beautiful sentiment. Like, yeah. He's pretty much just saying that it doesn't well, matter what I her mean, name is. Oh, he's, uh, okay, because I was gonna say, technically, he's wrong. He doesn't know who he is. No, he, he's, he, uh, he's saying not I'm- Bobby Dunbar, <laughs> his license is incorrect. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, it's weird that you got that from that, but he did, he's pretty much saying- I know I'm, who I am, I, except I, I don't. I know who you are, except you're not that person. Uh, and that's all that counts. The name doesn't that, matter is what I'm he's saying. He's saying, I'm me, you're my son, that's all that yeah. matters. And that really is the true sentiment of it's all. The like truth. I said, even the DNA test, it's like, does it really matter? Yes, we'd like to know the truth. Doesn't change who you are. Yeah, I your mean, bones are your bones. All, I mean, there is a certain amount of weight to put to your name and your lineage, but at the same time, the relationships you have with the living members is also very important. And really, that's all that matters. Yeah. And we're all going to be dust someday. That's a very nihilistic way to look at it, but sure. This settles the mystery of the boy that was found, and yet the chilling mystery surrounding the boy lost continues to persist. Many wonder what actually happened to Bobby Dunbar that day. Some continue to believe that he was eaten by an animal, such as an alligator or a bear, though no evidence, such as clothing, was ever found to suggest that. Some wonder if he was actually kidnapped after all. In an interview in 1932, Bobby Dunbar, who was probably Bruce Anderson, recalled a memory of his time with William Walters, in which he revealed that he remembered that there was another boy with him who fell off the wagon and died and was buried. Some wondered if the memory had been a memory of suggestion, as there had been theories posed by the prosecution at Walters' trial that he could have kidnapped both Anderson and Dunbar. Psychologically, some posit these theories could have allowed the boy to rationalize Bruce Anderson's death and allowed a narrative as Bobby Dunbar to begin. Regardless, almost 100 years after the incident, one family received closure while the other had it ripped away from them. Tragically, the mystery behind the disappearance of Bobby Dunbar will remain unsolved. It's a kind of a happy ending, but is it? 
I, I don't know. They should feel guilty because they stole a boy. No one stole anything. I they think. stole a boy. They thought it was their boy. And no, they said he had small eyes. They, that was one newspaper. Okay. 